there is two ways to get started with this. You can download a new VM image that has that whole tool chain set up for you. It takes a couple hours to download. It may take longer if all of you are downloading it at the same time. You can also, if there's a shell script, sequence of commands that will set things up in your current VM image. If you're really brave you, or really want to waste a lot of time dealing with frustrating software, you can try to set it up running on some other platform natively. I tried to get it setting up on my Mac and failed and give up after uh, enough frustration to convince the TAs we should make a VM image that you can just download. But if you like installing software and don't run, like running things in VirtualBox, you can do that. Don't recommend it. So we're going to start running Iron Kernel. So I will do make run. So I've compiled Iron Kernel. You see, so there are two things you see here. So this is the shell that we started Iron Kernel. And it's got a nice logo. Impressive ASCII art. So this is the shell that's running. What's running in the black box, that's the emulator. Right? So that's what you would really see if you were running this on a device with the ARM processor and a display like that. What we're seeing here, this is the interface to QEMU. So we can see things that are that interface between our ARM processor that is running our kernel and the outside world. So if we press a key, well, we're pressing it on our Mac first. Our Mac is sending it to a virtual box, which is sending it to the shell, which is sending it to QEMU, which is sending it to a program that's running in the emulated processor. We can press some keys. And it actually works. So we're seeing, and it's a little small there, right? you're seeing in the emulated processor, it's echoing what I type. You should be like amazed and awed that they were able to do this. You're looking like, oh, I can do echo in a shell. I can do it like in Word. I can get fancy fonts and colors. But this is much more impressive. And we can even type return and have multiple lines. If we do something more ambitious, like say an arrow key, then it will hang. So it's not quite ready for prime time but pretty impressive. And you wouldn't believe me that it was real if it didn't hang when I did something like press an arrow key. So I have to kill it. All of that is running with no other programs. You're starting loading a binary into this emulated ARM processor and running code. And it can handle keyboard interrupts and printing. Let me show you some other things. Parse key is what's getting called when the keyboard interrupt happens. And there's a few other layers before that, which We'll talk about maybe today, but probably more next class. But this function is getting called. And depending on the key press, it's doing something. And if it's not a return and not a backspace, it's trying to draw that character. And I have just uncommented this line, which calls setmem. And what setmem does let's see, is this code that is basically computing some address. So I've got it more zoomed in over here. Right, so we're computing some address. We're treating that as a mutable pointer to a 32-bit unsigned. And we're assigning some value to it. And the value in this case that I'm passing in, I'm calling it with 0, 1, and 0. So it's, the value is going to be 0. It's going to assign to the address here that's going to be 0, the value 0, and go through that loop one time. So what do we think is going to happen when we do this? So first of all, so if we did this in a regular program, so if we were running on top of Linux and we compiled a C program that did the equivalent of this, what would happen? Almost certainly. Did you understand? So what this is doing, we're storing a value in location 0. We're storing value 0. If we tried to do that, in a user level program running on a regular OS, what would happen? Yeah, we would get a seg fault, almost certainly a seg fault. We're writing to some address that's not part of our memory space. And address zero is not part of any user level program's address space. That's just the convention, but it, it could be it's part of some other program. It could be, you know, if we wrote to some other location, maybe it's part of our address space. But if we write to some random location or location 0, almost certainly we're going to get a set fault. Okay. If we do this in our kernel code, what do we think is going to happen? Are we going to get a seg fault? Definitely not going to get a seg fault. Right? The seg fault happens when the paging unit says this low-powered user code is trying to write somewhere it shouldn't. If we're the kernel, we own all of the memory. We can write to any address we want. No one in the process is going to stop us because 
the processor works for us. There's no protection there. We own the whole machine. If we want to write to location 0 or we want to write to location 12 or location 44,008,742, the processor is going to let us do that. Okay. So what do we think is going to happen when we write to location 0? So we've compiled it. So uh, nothing's happened yet. So this code is part of the keyboard handling code when I press a key. So I better press a key. And let's press a key. I pressed a key. I'm pressing more keys. I pressed one key, and it, when it got to the right to location zero, it has hung. And eventually, we do get a seg fault. So how did we get a seg fault there? Seems like everything I told you is wrong, that we're not getting the right to where we want. Did we actually get a seg fault? Or where did we get the seg fault? Is this part of our simulated machine, or this is something else? So remember when we run it, that QEMU window, that's our simulated machine. This is the shell that we started QEMU. This is our outside world. So we can do key presses here. The only thing that's really happening in our real machine is what we see there. We're not seeing a seg fault there. Eventually, that's going to crash because QEMU on our inside virtual box running on our actual processor with memory protection is eventually running some instruction it shouldn't. But our simulated OS, our iron kernel, our what's running on the ARM processor, just hung. Right? We didn't get any seg, seg fault. We overwrote some location in memory, which started to make strange things happen. Okay. And we can do more interesting things. So I'm going to change this code now. Instead of passing in 0, we're going to write at location uh, 1,024 squared. And we're going to write for a million spaces. So if we go back to the setman code, it's looping up to size. And we're going to write some values that depend on what the key press was. OK, so let's try this. Oops. So any guesses what's going to happen before I start pressing keys? What are the possible things that could happen? So we saw one possible thing that could happen if we wrote to location 0. It eventually, so it hangs our OS, and eventually QMU crashes. What if we're writing to some other locations in memory? What other things might happen? So if we picked a random location in memory, so we've got a 32-bit OS, right? So we've got two 32 addresses. If we picked some random one and we wrote something there, what do we expect to happen? What's going on at our average address in memory, even in a small 32-bit processor? So how many of our 2 to 32 locations have something useful in them? When we're, especially if we're just starting a kernel, not actually running any, any programs doing anything? Good, yeah. So the vast majority of locations in memory, we could put whatever we want there, and nothing's going to change. But this is why you should be really happy when you start seeing crashes or strange behavior or illegal instructions and things like that. That means you're actually doing something that matters. That is big progress. Like the worst thing is if you do all this stuff and nothing happens, you have no idea what you're doing. You don't know if you're making progress or not. You're not seeing any impact to what you do. So if you wrote at some random location in memory, chances are nothing's going to happen. What are locations where something interesting would happen if you wrote to them? There's only some places where if you wrote to it, strange things could start happening. So what is somewhere in memory? when we're running our kernel. Everything in the machine is, is somewhere in the simulated machine. The code, right, the code that we compiled that turned into the binary, right, that's loaded somewhere in that processor. So somewhere in memory is that actual code. So if we start overwriting our own code with other things, strange things might happen. Right? That's likely to lead to uh, the OS hanging or something bizarre happening. This location I picked is actually not where our code is. It's where something else is. And I'll start typing, which should give you a pretty good idea of where it is. So let's type some letters. Right, so that's where the screen buffer is. Right, so that's also somewhere in memory. It happens to be at this location, 1024 times 1024. Well, that's this point here. What we're seeing on our display is just mapping whatever is in that region of memory is being mapped to colors on our screen. QMU is doing that part of it. Right? QMU is emulating the processor. It's also emulating the display. And the display, how a normal video card works, right? it's just 
there's some region of memory that's being mapped onto what you see on the screen. And that's all that's happening here. Except for now, because I'm the kernel, I can write to that region just like I can write to any other location of memory. A user level program, if you want to paint on the screen, you've got to do it by going through calls that eventually are getting to kernel code that can actually put things in that memory. You're not able to directly modify bits in memory. Because if you could, well, you could affect everything on the screen, even if your program's running in some other little window. And, and on some systems, programs can do that. It's not a desirable property to have in a modern operating system. But it's a fun property to have in Iron Kernel that we can do anything, change our colors. Um, if you made this function, so I'm computing, right, the key press is an 8-bit character. The colors are 24-bit, but there's a 32-bit value in each location. So I'm doing something to compute a 32-bit value that I think can only get me reds and greens because I only set some of the bits of the color. The rest are, I guess the blues are always zeros. Actually, yeah, the blues are always zeros. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that when you're at the kernel level, you have control over. Everything that's displayed is just some region of memory. The key press is some interrupt, and I think we have a little time to start looking at that, so let me show you how the interrupts get set up. Okay, so here's the code that sets up the table of interrupts to set up that key press. So there's some physical thing that happens, and QMU, when I touch the key in the shell that QMU is running, is going to simulate that wire on the processor. There's some interface between the processor that would get a signal when, when the key's pressed. And we want that to lead to an interrupt. What's happening here is that the enable is setting up what happens when that interrupt happens. And if we look at the here, OK, so this is setting up the interrupt for the keyboard. We're calling our keyboard table with key press. So what is key press? What do you think key press is? And there are two correct answers to this, depending on well, I, I, there are many correct answers. So if we look at the enable code, we can see what's getting passed in. OK, so here's the enable. Right? We're calling enable, passing in the, the IRQ that's giving us the connection to the interrupts. And we're also passing in a function, an unsafe function. But we're passing in a function. That's the function that gets called when that interrupt happens. Now, what is the function at the level of the OS does the OS understand Rust functions and types and things like this? Yeah, certainly not, right? At the level of the OS, what is the function? Here's the enable, right? So we're calling enable. Where did the enable go? So this is the key press function that's being passed in when we call enable. And here's enable. What enable is doing is setting a word. So a word is 32 bits in memory. Somewhere in this table with the value ISR, right? ISR is this function. Well, that's just an address. It's turning that into a 32-bit number. That's the location in memory where the code for that function is. That's all that's getting sent in OS is some 32-bit value, which is being set there. And it's a little more complicated because you're computing some offset. But that's the function that's going to be called when the key press happens. And to have that be set, we look at, so we've set the interrupt. And um, so the code, so you're not going to have to write any ARM assembly code for problems set before. If you're ambitious and bold, you might try to write some. But the code here is setting up the table that has those interrupts. So the processor knows where to go. When that interrupt comes, it's going to jump to this function. And that's all in this table. And the important part of it is we're passing in a function, which is what happens when the key press happens. OK, so you should get started with Pumps Up 4. It will be posted really soon. And the first parts of it are for you to sort of play around with the kernel and experiment with things like this to see if you can change how printing happens, change some colors, understand how a key press works, really understand what's going on and what's there now. And the final part of it, you're going to actually implement a simple file system. It's not going to use the disk. It's going to be all stored in memory. So it won't survive if your OS crashes but we'll give you a, something pretty close to a file system.